What's up? I'm AJ, and welcome back to Gen Z Garage. So disclaimer before I get into the contents of the video, I'm kind of sick right now, so my voice is a bit deeper and raspier, but I promise I'm okay, I just wanted to make a video. Um, so in the last video, we disassembled the engine, and here are all the parts displayed out for you to see. Um, in this video, I'm going to be measuring the cylinder bores so I can get new pistons and rings before I take the engine to the machine shop. But before I get into that, I'd like to tell you what the answer to the trivia question is from last video. In the last video, we asked you what this access panel was on the side of the Iron Duke. Many of you said this was the access panel for the oil pump drive shaft. You are correct. However, this isn't the whole story. This is actually the original location for the distributor in Chevy's 153 cubic inch four cylinder, for which the Iron Duke was based on. Like most pushrod motors of the time, the camshaft would drive the distributor, which in turn would drive the oil pump through the use of connective shaft. This proved to be a very inconvenient location as it interfered with the ability for the engine to drive multiple accessories. When the Iron Duke was released in 1977, the distributor was moved further back to provide clearance for the front of the motor. This is where the distributor remained until it was eventually eliminated entirely when the block was redesigned for the 1987 model year when they introduced the DIS ignition. What's interesting to note, however, is that even though this was a carryover from the 153 cubic inch Chevy into the Iron Duke, the outboard slash boat version of the Iron Duke continued to use the distributor in this location, and a revised head that was more similar to the original 153 cubic inch Chevy four-cylinder. Thanks again for playing, and thank you to Sleek Fierro for the information. The tools we will be using in this video include the digital bore scope and the digital caliper. We will be referencing those measurements with those in the Fiero service manual from the motor store. Hopefully I get to use this crescent wrench. I love this crescent wrench. It is, it is the best. Um, I, as of now, I declare it the logo of Gen Z garage. So that's official. Um, let's get started. <laughs> Before I do any measurements at all, it's important that I first identify the baseline for this engine when new. I reference this in the factory service manual and identify a 4 inch bore or 101.6 millimeters in metric for the Iron Duke. I'll then take my metric caliper and confirm my standard bore size of 101.6. Note that while my engine has wear, the top of the engine bores are untouched and should still have the factory measurement. Good. I measure 101.6. This means that the engine has never been previously bored and likely never rebuilt. In order to determine the amount of wear on the cylinder bores, I now need to assemble the components of my bore gauge to get as close as possible to the 101.6 mm measurement of the factory bore. I select a spacer and a pressure rod and assemble them to a length of 102.5 mm. This can be confirmed by measuring the assembled sides with the digital caliper. I'm going to want to take multiple measurements of each of the cylinders, but first I'll write down my starting number as the configured size of my bore scope. I'll then create a separate section for each cylinder so that I can keep track of my measurements. I start with the first cylinder at the front of the block and begin measuring at the top. It's important that I begin measuring below the ridge as shown in the diagram to the right. I also measure perpendicular to the engine intentionally so that I measure the wear on the thrust side of the cylinder wall, which is usually the worst. I will need to take three measurements from the top below the ridge, middle of the cylinder bore, and bottom of the cylinder bore, just where the cylinder wear begins. This will give a good indication of the overall wear. These numbers should not be average, but instead you take the worst of the three. I make my way to the clipboard and write down the measurements. They're not great, but pretty typical for a 130,000 mile Iron Duke. I then make my way to the second cylinder and measure the same as I did with the first. 
Typically after getting all three measurements, you want to shift the bore scope 45 degrees and remeasure again. The purpose of this, as shown in the diagram to the right, is to determine whether or not the cylinder is out of round. This can happen because the thrust side of the piston can wear more than the other three sides, causing the cylinder to elongate. In this case, I already know from the ridge at the top that I'm going to need a cylinder hone. I just need to know how much. So I'm really only concerned with measuring the worst part of the cylinder anyway. Once again, I write down my measurements for cylinder 2, which seem pretty consistent with cylinder 1. I then measure cylinder 3, using the same as I did for cylinder 1 and 2. And then write down my measurements. And cylinder 4. I then take each of the measured numbers and subtract the difference between the measured bore size and the assembled length of the bore scope. As it turns out, I'm right at 30 overbore in the worst spots already. While I could have my engine bored to 30 overbore overall, the safer bet is to simply just go to the next size up and ask the machine shop to bore and hone my engine to 40 overbore. These engines can safely be bored to 60 over, so 40 is no huge problem. I might even pick up a horsepower or two from it. If you wanted to double check your measurements, you can always check the ring gap with the feeler gauge. You can do this by removing the top rings from the piston and placing it at the top of the cylinder wall by the ridge. You then take the same piston and shove it down through the top to ensure the piston is accurately placed equidistant from the top but below the ridge of the cylinder wall. Then use the feeler gauge to measure the gap and compare it to the chart in the service manual to see if it's within acceptable range. Remember, this will give you the measurement at the top, but may not give you an accurate measurement of the worst part of the cylinder in the middle. Although we definitely have to machine the block, it's actually in pretty good condition considering its age and the number of miles on the car. There was no perceivable metal shavings in the oil pan, and we knew that it ran acceptably before we began tearing it down. The connecting rod and main bearing still had some life, but we were definitely starting to show wear and delamination of the bearing surface. We probably had at least another 10,000 miles. The pistons are not in too bad a shape, but there is clearly some wear on the piston skirt which signifies the cylinder walls were beginning to get out of round. The camshaft was also decent, we could probably reuse it, however, with replacement camshafts around $100, it's better to buy a new camshaft with a new set of lifters, rather than having to reuse the old ones. Even though the valves themselves appear to be in excellent shape in the combustion chamber, they showed some wear at the top where there were obvious signs of chipping and streaking on the valve tops. This is generally caused by loose rocker arms in which the rockers are slapping along the top of the valves. The Iron Duke has non-adjustable rocker arms, which means that as these components wear, you'll typically lose the ability for these components to stay tight. Furthermore, a millimeter of wear on the cam lobe, a millimeter of wear on the lifter roller, another on the push rods, another on the rocker arm, and another on the tops of the valves, all adds up to overall power loss. And while these parts are available, this is not where you want to skimp and save money. If all of that wasn't enough of a reason for me to simply rebuild with new rings and bearings, I'll also need to solve this problem, which is much easier for them to do than it is for me. So in today's video, we measured the cylinder bores, and based on the measurements, I'm not going to be able to do it here at the garage. I'm probably going to have to take it to the engine shop and by probably I mean definitely because um, the measurements are pretty large. Uh, if you want to see my journey in repairing the car and also the insides of the car, um, please make sure to like and subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss any videos. The trivia question for today is do you know if there's a place or like a website or something that sells larger crescent wrenches and if so what is it because i want to like crescent wrench staff thing that would be really cool so please please let me know in the comments below thank you for watching uh i will see you in the next video
tested a lot of Oldsmobiles, and in particular, many 88s. We've always liked them. But this newest edition is the best one yet, for many reasons. Take a look. Our test car had the heavy-duty shocks and torsion bars. This beefier suspension system goes out as an option for about $16. It's well worth it. It enabled us to run the pylon course faster with more stability and less body lead. Rebound and recovery were good. Here's that same run head-on in slow motion. At 45 miles an hour, you can see the suspension and tires really working. For a big 4,300 pound hauler, our driver was able to bring the 88 through the corners with comparative ease. This car shares some of its suspension components with Buick. As a result, they've adopted Buick's camber compensation system. With this method, the camber opposes the shift of the center of gravity. It's very effective in high-speed cornering, as well as minimizing the effects of heavy crosswinds on the highway. All Oldsmobiles feature the latest GM safety innovations for 71. Guardrails in the doors, a double panel roof, which acts essentially as a roll cage. Also, a steel barrier between the rear seat and the luggage compartment. In the time that we had this car from the factory, we were amazed at the number of people who thought it was a 98. It's almost as plush. And for my money, a better buy.